So, the main characters all get a fetch quest for a MacGuffin that will help Jack eventually kill Chuck. Now, this could be a fairly standard mystery with interesting twists and turns. Unfortunately, the worst writers of the show were given this episode. Meaning, a basic plot not only has to be rendered idiotic, but we get to beat and abuse the canon while we do it. Because apparently, whoever's making this show has never bothered to actually watch the show. Let me see if I can explain why this episode made me so angry. The boys get a clue that the thing they're looking for was once owned by Sister Jo. Um, she's going to be Sister Jo today. So they go and confront her about it, and she reveals that she had made a deal with Ruby. Now, immediately, I get ready to protest, because that doesn't fit with things known about the timeline around this character. Oh, but then, when the boys, when they go to hell, it's revealed that it was a trap by Sister Jo all along, and they get attacked by demons. <gasps> all of a sudden... My opinion just changed. This was brilliant. An almost perfect example of dramatic irony. Because, you know, we, the audience, we had been told about Joe's past. We knew her origin. And we knew that what she said about Ruby had to be a lie. But the brothers weren't there. They didn't know that. This is almost textbook. Why, we, the audience, we should have known all along that something was wrong with what Joe told them because of... Canon inconsistency. I mean, this is actually brilliant. And then Cass went to the Big Empty. And there he ran into Ruby. And you'll be Ruby today. And she ups and reveals, Oh no, the part about canon breaking? Yeah, that, that was actually true. It was the details that were the lie. And there you go. For those of you that forget, I'm going to put up the line from episode 1313. This was said by Sister Jo. Again, she specifies, after the fall, she found a woman praying who became her vessel. The fall? That's the finale of season 8, the start of season 9, when all the angels were forced out of heaven. That's clear and unambiguous and supernatural. And I already know what some defenders are probably going to say. Maybe she was lying back then. Just stop. Stop that. I'm going to take a minute and explain to you how to grade plot holes. So, the story tells us something, but we don't know details. The audience has to invent a couple of things and fill in some gaps to make it all work. So, this would be the equivalent of what the audience has to invent to make the fact of Sister Joe coming to Earth in Season 9 work with the rest of the show. You don't even have to write real small in here. You could fit everything onto a simple business card. This... This is what the audience has to invent to make Sister Jo coming to Earth in Season 4 work with the rest of the show. She shows up in Season 9, she shows it up in Season 4. If the audience has to write more than you did to make your story work, then you suck as a writer. At some point, why do we even care about you as a writer since we're doing more of the work than you are? They had a chance to set up a brilliantly written moment as storytellers and really prove to the audience that they actually cared about the world they're writing in and respect the audience's intelligence. But nope, let's just throw it all away because I don't even know why. Are, are they just trying to check off old guest stars that they're bringing back? And why not freaking Charlie? She was around during that time. It would make sense for her to have worked with Sister Joe at some point. I can accept a plot hole. In a story, is, as long as the story's quality is proportional or greater to said plot hole. The, the larger a logic hiccup, the better the story needs to be to at least make the plot hole worth it. Well, spoiler warning, this episode wasn't good enough to justify this level of a plot hole. It, and that's not the worst part. Here, I'm going to fix this episode right now. So you got our Sam and Dean, which we all know and love. And this episode... The Hunter Corps Sam and Dean show up, or I sometimes want to call them Sam and Dean Wayne, since 
They're much more like Batman in that world. How about we start off with Sam and Dean searching everything and then right as they have just exhausted their efforts to find the occultum, their alternate Hunter Corps versions show up. They're fleeing their destroying world. Then, while the two of them are interacting, you have them reveal that, oh yeah, they had an adventure where they hunted down the occultum. The two of them tell our Sam and Dean what the occultum is and what they had to do to go find it. And voila, there's your episode. Even better with this setup... The search itself gives you a wide flexibility for time where you can add to or subtract from it as needed to fill out the program. You could have our protagonist get started retracing the steps Hunter Core took and then following some clues that both worlds had in common and then challenges arise that are different this time. They have to deal with something unexpected. Or you just make the search identical. Have these two just follow along the exact same path. Gives you an opportunity for some humorous situations. Like you can have one Dean calling the other Dean on the phone saying, Oh, uh, we forgot to tell you, uh, the church is going to be guarded by hellhounds. Well, the other Dean's like, Oh yeah, I noticed that. Or you could make the search itself pretty short. Make it exactly like Hunter Core, so it goes real smoothly, doesn't take up much time. And then that gives the audience more time to enjoy Sam and Dean having antics with Sam and Dean. See? Quick, easy fix to this episode's plot. Doesn't break canon and opens up all sorts of storytelling possibilities. How bad was this episode? It couldn't even keep continuity with itself. When Sam and Dean are getting ready to leave, they taunt our Dean about touching the car. The question is when? I double checked and the four protagonists drove Baby to the church while the other Sam and Dean were locked up in the bunker. So then what? The guys all drove back, maybe took an eight hour power nap and then the Sam and Dean went in and touched it? I mean it really does look like Dean just dismisses the doppelgangers right away and tells them to get out. When would they get a chance to go touch Baby without Dean noticing? See what I mean? You have to concoct an entire act of the episode yourself to try and fix this story's gaping logic holes. Heck, it's too bad we didn't get to see that, as it could have been fairly entertaining to watch this other Sam and Dean try to sneak around themselves to check out the car that they love. But oh no, no, let's have flashbacks with Sister Joe and Ruby instead, which just made no damn sense. The one thing I will give this episode, is that for a very long time in my blog, I have talked about, and one of the things that fascinates me in the supernatural world, with its examination of societies and institutions, and, you know, what happens when society has a need for something and there's no proper structure for it, like hunters. I've always expressed thoughts over examining what stories and places would look like, where maybe hunters are like the cops and firefighters in a society, or... Maybe they're recognized, but despised. And I'll admit, this episode proposing them as a corporation? Not an idea I'd come up with, but one I approve of. And I really would have loved to have seen even more of what Winchester Inc. was like. Especially with the idea of John setting it up and running it. Heck, the alternate Sam and Dean even show up listening to Savage Garden, which was a high school guilty pleasure of mine. So part of me half feels like this episode had shout outs specifically for me. I just wish they had actually focused on the parts that I liked and didn't bother with all the parts that had to break everything. Some individual scenes were kind of entertaining, but then, but then were followed by others that just didn't work. The issue of Jack's soul still makes no sense. But I may save that for the next episode, and as this one is probably going to run a little long. So all total, I mean, this episode, yeah, I'll be frank, it's a one. And it's only getting that one shell for the shameless pandering it's doing to me personally, which I doubt the writers even intended. Still, I haven't felt this angry about the sheer incompetence and wasted potential of an episode pretty much since they ruined Chuck at the end of season 14. Seven episodes remaining, and you're still letting some out of this poor quality? Yeah, I, I'm not happy. I really hope next week's better.